Hello, and uh, welcome to a quick introduction to uh, riddles in Ihanzu. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend a big thank you to both Alice and Crispina for putting this workshop together and for giving me space to talk about this topic, which I really only began looking at for Ihanzu very recently. Also, I managed to pick up a small cold on my way down from Ibaga to Babati, so I'm afraid I'm going to be sounding a bit hoarse. Ihanzu, very briefly, is a Bantu language of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. It has pretty clear genetic links to both Nilamba and um, Nyaturu, and uh, is also in contact with Nilamba, Iraq, Sukuma, and the Hadza-speaking communities. It's spoken in the northernmost district of Singida region called Mkalama. Surprisingly to me, there is an entire master's level dissertation which has been written, not so much about Ihanzu riddles themselves, but of the role of the riddle in Ihanzu society, particularly this dissertation written by Amos Ben Damka at the Open University of Tanzania in 2015, attempts to compare the changes in riddling before and after Uhuru or Tanzanian independence in 1961. Uh, aside from the approximately 28 riddles in Damka's dissertation, uh, no other written collections of Ihanzu riddles, uh, to my knowledge, exist. This talk, in addition to Damka's materials, relies on 12 recordings made over the past month or so and which will eventually be deposited with the ELAR archive associated with my current funded research. The recordings total approximately 225 minutes, of which a little bit more than half is available in a language other than Ihanzu. And in this case, that means Swahili translations and transcriptions were made by uh, the Ihanzu local researchers uh, employed with the current project, Samueli Isaya and uh, Sarah Kaleel. Uh, recordings were made in three locations in Mkalama district with five Ihanzu speakers, mostly men, it must be admitted, between the ages of 39 and 82. And sort of in terms of content, the recordings are a mix of interviewees posing riddles to their interviewers, as well as interviews loosely based on Alice Mitchell's question prompts. I put actual in double quotes here because uh, the one-on-one -on -one interview environment does not very closely mirror the context in which riddles are typically posed. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Here is a photo of Ihanzu local researcher, Sara Kalaeli interviewing John Kipimo as part of this research. We've collected more than 30 Ihanzu riddles during this process with uh, several repeats. And uh, though the environment is largely artificial, I believe we have captured several authentic aspects of Ihanzu riddling. Throughout the recordings, we were given several words for the phenomenon we were recording. The first, Ihalitio, was uh, the one that the local researchers seemed to think was the most precise and to which we will return later. The forms highlighted here can be de decomposed as to the right but may ultimately be recent uh, adoptions from Nilamba. Um, the form imahumo is actually a broader term which includes uh, narratives. So as such, the term ihalitio is probably closest equivalent to riddling, um, and imahumo is probably a larger term, roughly storytelling, under which riddling exists as a subcategory. In terms of larger contexts, one interview gave this fairly typical, I would say, response to what the purpose of riddles was. And he said, Ihanzu's stories and riddles taught us to get along with each other, to respect adults, and later on, to pass on stories. Um, an, an equally typical response is the one shown here, in which another interviewee states that these days, the Dalimu are gone. Everyone's child sleeps at their own place. Stories and songs are gone there. If you tell a child that you're going to tell them a story, they won't listen. They were already told at school, I don't know. For further context, and from what I understand, the Dalimu 
was a small house shared by adolescents, let's say between the ages of maybe like 11 and 18 or 19, once they felt they were no longer children. And these were gendered spaces, it seems. So they would be for either only boys or only girls. And uh, the term that Dalimu is often translated by in Swahili is the word bueni, which means school hostel. Um, though the Dalimu were more than places to sleep, however, they were important loci of learning and acculturation, and each had an old man or old woman in charge. So in addition to at the home with smaller children, it was here in the Dalimu, in the groups of similar aged young adults and adolescents, that riddling took place in the past. And uh, the information generally uh, agrees that this was an evening activity. It wasn't something that was done during the day. So in his dissertation, Damka agrees with the previous interviewee in noting that the role of riddles has generally declined or decreased. Um, in his conclusion, he lists 10 causes for this, which I've translated from the Swahili. Um, but I, I really feel the most significant is number three. Essentially, the contemporary economy is so oriented to the family homestead as the primary unit of production, in this case, agricultural or small industrial production, that the opportunity for people to come together in the evenings, the blueprint of which uh, being the Dalimu and riddles, people of different households, but of similar age sets coming uh, together to be sort of led by an elder and be acculturated and taught riddles. Uh, that's sort of essentially, the opportunity has essentially become zero in the modern uh, economy. Moving on now to the riddling sequence, we see that the initial call from the riddler is hali hali, to which the audience will answer hali. Note that our word for the genre, ihalitio, can probably be decomposed to having this form as a root. Following the answer comes the riddle, which, if answered correctly, will be, will be met with more riddles, or if answered incorrectly, will result in a back and forth in which the riddle teller will ask the prospective answerer for compensation for the answer they couldn't guess. Um, and this is generally a town, a person, a cattle, or sometimes even foodstuff. I'd like to quickly give an example of an Ihanzu riddle because though many are simply given as the formulae we've seen um, for other languages commonly, many are also posed in a much more narrative way. Um, consider, for example, the following. <laughs> So we're hunting and we meet with a dead. and I had two arrows and I shot the first one. I hit the dick, dick and it pooped out and then he asks Tony what is this so then he repeats the image again and he says what is it he says I don't know and then and then he starts sort of um, encouraging him for an answer here. So rather than simply a very, uh, a very sort of simple formula, so in this case it would be, I was hunting a dick dick and when I hit it with an arrow, a uh, flower came out. Uh, it was given in sort of an entire context here, you know, here we're, we're here in the forest and I draw my arrow and I shoot it. So it's embedded in a larger narrative, a narrative of hunting. Um, and, uh, and then of course, and then sort of the, the narrative and the questioning proceeds from there. But it's interesting because we have, uh, in, in this case, we have narrative plus sort of a provoking question at the end. Tell me, what is this? Uh, so I thought that that was quite interesting because it was somewhat different from what we've seen in the literature and uh, maybe a little bit more tied to this sort of the narrative nature or the kind of spoken nature of the riddle. Um, furthermore, 
the bargaining for the answer to a riddle in the Hanzu was seemed consistently more involved than other examples from the languages that we've seen. So again, the bargaining can be for a town, a person, cattle, or foodstuff. And here we see quite a lengthy exchange in which various offers are refused. He says, I don't know. And he says, why? Why don't you know? He says, it's hard. So the guy says, come on, give me something. Give me something. I'll give you some a place that I know. I give you Ihanzu, which is a place in Israel. And he says, come on. He says, come on, you can eat peanuts there. And he goes, no, the road is not. Well, he says, well, I'll give you Bukundi. And he says, ah, Bukundi is full of dust. And he says, ah, let's stay in Ibaga, where we are now. And he says, ah, in Ibaga, the water is salty. Maybe I'll give you a person. And he says, give me a person. He says, a way or man? He says, either. He says, I'll give you Magufuli, who's the president. And he says, you're making me tired. Clearly doesn't want Magufuli. And he says, you got to keep on going until I agree. He says, we'll finish everybody before you agree. He says, I'll give you Mama Alan. And he says, I agree. And then they have a good laugh about it. And I have a feeling that Mama Alan is somebody that is related to one of them, it's kin. So in this way, the riddles are perspective, the, the riddler and the perspective answerer are, are engaging in a physical geography lesson. So they're telling each other what they know of, of Ihanzu geography and geography nearby, uh, but also one of moral geography in which places are good places and places are bad places. And uh, Geography of kin, places where the Riddler's kin lives and gifts of kin are usually accepted. And this is pretty consistent, this sort of length of bargaining back and forth um, to an extent that with the Ihanzu riddles that we have, in fact, the bargaining was, was a more involved, more interactive and actually longer part of the riddle than the actual riddle itself. So Ihanzu riddles, uh, make heavy use of symbolism, often idiophones. So here we have two examples. We have the form pingiri pingiri kunyonyela, which translates just as pingili pingili kunyonyela. And the answer is munkira wankolo, the pace of a sheep. And uh, the, next, uh, the next question is nsimbunga, nsimbunga, to which the translation is nsimbunga. And the answer is itwela nyeu, which is the head of a cat. Um, and the highlighted forms could not be translated directly here. So we have pingiri pingiri, which refers to the, the way that a sheep walks, and uh, this nsimbunga, which apparently somehow uh, has something to do with the head of a, hat, a cat. So again, we see this sort of heavy reliance on, uh, on sort of seemingly very locally relevant, um, maybe idiophones here. And finally, uh, to conclude, the question was posed if riddles involve sexual references and sort of, to me, given the context of the Dalimu as one of the prime locations of transmission, I would expect this to be the case. Um, the one possible example I have is the following. So, kunu gu, nu kunu gu, which translates as here, gu, and there, gu. So again, we see another sound symbolic form, gu. And the answer is mitala, a man with more than one wife. Uh, this was explained to me, this gu was explained to me as the polygynous husband banging on the doors of his many wives. But of course, thinking again of a uh, house uh, uh, sort of um, slapdash made full of young men between 12 and 19, and an old man who's telling the uh, stories one can imagine that the banging could very possibly be of a conjugal nature as well.
Thank you very much. And uh, that's the end of my talk.